Good morning, goeiemorgen en allemaal wat mijn stem kan hoor. Ons begroeting van morgen is in die naam van Koning Jesus. Hij is die een wat voor ons die rede gee om te leven. Ons weet dat Jesus die koning van alle konings is en ons erken hem, erken hem van morgen als die een wat in die dood het opgestaan die een wat sy, neve, sy leven neergeleid het en vir ons een nieuwe begin gegeet. So, um, welkom by die dienst van morgen. Uh, hier vanuit Messina, uh, my naam is Marius Luther, vir die wat my nog nie uh, ontmoet het of ken het nie. Uh, ek staan onder die leiding van uh, Pastoor Soys, uh, onder die vaandel van Christ Identity. Een wonderlijke voorrecht om allemaal te begroet vanmorgen in die naam van Koning Jesus. Uh, ons weet dat Jesus een naam voor alle name gekry het en ons voel vanmorgen baie veilig, want ons weet die naam van die Heere is een sterk toering. Die woord van die Heere leer ons dat die rechtverdig is, hardloop in sy naam en daarin vind ons ons beskitting. Ons goed jylle vanuit de lieflike koel Messina vanmorgen um, met de wonderlijke landsreen uh, wat ons hier beleef en uh, laat my sublief toe om saam met iedereen die af te bid soos wat ons recht maak om die woord van die Heere te hoor. Halleluja! So kom ons bid saam Heilige Vader Ons herken u vanmorgen als die skepper van hemel en aarde. Ons kom na die troon toe vanmorgen in die naam van Jesus Christus. Ons het niks anders en niemand anders om op staat te maak vanmorgen nie, Heere. Ons kom ook nie eers met baie dinge in ons hande nie, Vader. Maar al wat ons het is dankbare harte en in alle nederigheid. Kom sê ons vir u baie dankie, Heere. Dankie dat ons lewe, dankie dat ons lichaam is sterk en gezond is vanmorgen. Dankie dat u alles laat gebeur volgens u raadsbesluit. Ons herken dat u vanmorgen regeer van die hemelse plekke, so vraag ook dat u vanmorgen kom regeer in onze fysische posities waar ons self bevind, Heere. En eelder en elk wat een kind van die naam, een kind van Jezus is, wil ons bid dat u vir die kracht sal gee, Heere, die boonste, uit wanneer ons die woord van God oopmaak vanmorgen, wil u ook ons verstand kom verlig, Heere, en vir ons innerlijke kracht gee, so dat onze gees ook hier nieuwe kan word vanmorgen. Uh, wees dan saam met ons, Heere, en sê in elke wat vanmorgen die naam sal aanroep, in Jesus naam. Amen. So yes, uh, once again, welcome, and uh, please bear with me. I will interchangeably be using um, the both, uh, both English and Afrikaans just to assist um, the multitude of people who is uh, listening to this message this morning. So, um, as you are aware, uh, so many things are happening in the world today. We, we are looking at all the prophecies uh, that is written for us in the Word of God, which He so carefully uh, kept together over all these years, so that we will not be misled in the end times, and we will also have um, a clear understanding of, of what the expectations of the Lord is. And this morning we want to talk about um, the issue of servanthood. When, when we come to, to the Lord and we give our, our lives over to Him, we realize that um, it, this is not just a matter of getting saved. Um, yes, for sure, that is the best thing you can do for yourself because I believe nobody wants to die and, and go to um, um, a place that is not so comfortable, right? But at the end of the day, it is also about understanding what this package of salvation is about. Also understanding what is the mission, the heart cry of God, and what are the expectations that God is expecting from each one of us. So um, we look around us today, as I said, and we, and we, and we realize that there's a lot of instability today. Um, as we were fellowshipping over the weekend with some of the brothers and sisters, we were asking ourselves, but which part of the world today is really stable? Which part can, is there a geographic, is it a country or a city that can tell us that they are at perfect peace, they don't have any worry, they don't have any fear, and everything is happening just the way it should be happening. So, um, and as we were just talking to one another, we realized that uh, surely the foundations of the world has been shaken. Uh, we look at issues at, um, at, at, at 
think it's in Sri Lanka, at Pakistan, at Iran. We look at people who's got um, who does not have uh, fuel. You know, they've got fuel shortages. There's there's food uh, shortages. Um, there's people that is heavily even even the, the the agendas. If you look at it, the plans that the world leaders are coming up with is not necessarily concrete plans and, and when they implement it even there's a lot of confusion around these plans there's a lot of um, suspicion um, that those who are being led and those who are leading people that there's just a big drift at the moment um, uh, developing between these groups of people so definitely sure um, in this uncer uncertain times one has to ask yourself but what is my foundation? What are those things that I'm going to build my life on? What will be the motivation and the basis of each of my decisions? Because the word of the Lord tells us that everything that a person is doing in their own eyes, it is right. But the Lord judged the motives of the heart. So um, we, we, we also learned the, the, from the parable that Jesus said that Whoever is, list, is hearing his words and um, is actually doing what his words is telling them to do can be compared to a person who has built his house on a solid foundation, on a rock. And when the storms of life come, when the winds and the hurricanes and all these difficult things are coming, life's troubles are coming, they could not break the house. The house was still standing. Um... And to be honest with you, I can really see that in amongst my 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 circles, that the people who who reacted or built their lives either on worldly principles or who counted on their education or their careers um, or even their monies, all of a sudden these things are being shaken, and that is why people become fearful, and ultimately they end up making decisions that might not be a quality decision. And the end of those decisions, the Bible tells us, will lead to death. Um, so we, you, you know, for even a day, you go into arguments um, as people are questioning your faith. You have to defend your faith because the Bible tells us that we must be ready to give an answer uh, to anybody who is asking why we believe the way we do. So... Um, and, and, and this one specific argument around uh, at work, around the table, I recall um, as guys were now just putting accusations of this thing that they label these days of, what do they call it, anti-vaxxers and what more. And I said, no, 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 no. Um, that is a term that whoever in the world decided there will be a group of vaxxers and there will be a group of anti-vaxxers. No, I'm not one. I'm not one of those I'm a person who believes in the truth and I take the truth, the, the, the word of God being written for us as the truth. So as I'm searching and studying the scriptures, um, logic shows me that, that this thing does not make sense. So it's not for you to come and put a label on me. Um, you know, I have always abstained or, or tried to take care of my body. So previously I didn't inject any kind of drugs or cigarettes so can you see that, and if you ask me what was the motive of my decisions, I will still go back and tell you even 20 years ago, I read, started reading the word of God and from that, I based the principles of my life. I took the principles of God and started building um, that into my life. That's why I'm coming to these conclusions. And, um, and as the story is evolving, you can now see how people are, are slowly realizing but someone has been lying to us along the route and and, and 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 as we were in this argument the one person said it straight now let me tell you I was scared I was afraid and that's why I did it and at that point I realized like look okay look then then there's no argument here you just stated why you you did uh, what you did um, so so that's fine uh, all I can tell you is um, any decision that is made out of fear or without faith, according to the word of God, that becomes sin to you. Um, so by faith, we believe that our bodies and our soul and our spirit belongs to God because he created us 
we went astray, but he also came back and he purchased us. So we have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And that is the reason why I cannot just, you know, do anything the way I want. I need to consult. I need to subject myself, my plans, whatever I want to do. I need to go back to my maker and ask for guidance, right? And again, as I'm saying, as you read through the word of God, these things that is currently unclear for the ones who are in darkness, for you, Jesus said, whoever follows me will never be in darkness. You will always have light, right? Amen. So so this, these are the kind of things that's happening to us. And, um, and I really want to um, echo the words of Jesus where he was saying, um, fear not, little flock, because it pleased the Father to give the kingdom of heaven unto you. Uh, do not be discouraged. Um, he's telling you that he is the good shepherd. He already overcame this world. He, he, uh, if you read the Bible, you will see even John wrote, he wrote to fathers, he wrote to young men, and he told them, uh, be strong in the Lord. You've already overcome, and you will overcome all the persecutions, all these evil people who are rising up against the standards of God. You will overcome them by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of your testimony, and also if you do not love your life until the end of days. So this is it. If, 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 if we follow those things, the Lord gives us that assurance that we can know that we become children of God. So what do I want to talk to, to, to each one of us today is, is the, the concept of um, how are we working with God? What, what happens after you receive your salvation and how do I make sure that I that I keep my salvation. So last, last week we spoke about um, repent for the kingdom of God is here. And I just want to quickly touch on that again. So, so Jesus came, as we were saying, whatever was destroyed by the works of the devil, Jesus came to restore that and to also take back the authority which uh, the devil took from Adam, right? Now, Jesus had to go through a couple of, um, as, he, as he said it to John, to fulfill all uh, righteousness. So he had to go through everything that was prophesied over his life. Um, he had to make sure that he, it's almost like a checkbook, you know, uh, a, 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 a tick list. Um, uh, I shall not sin, you know, I shall, I shall, um, I shall bound up those who are broken hearted. I shall heal the sick. And, and this is the thing that I want to talk to you about. And at the end of the day, uh, even resisting temptations from the devil and uh, ultimately being the faithful servant, mark that word, the faithful servant that, that God appointed him or asked him to do uh, when he is on earth. Um, he managed to, to accomplish all those things so that at the end of the day, the Bible tells us that he stripped all the demonic forces, all the, the demons and Satan himself, he stripped them from all their powers and their authority and he made a public spectacle of all of them, meaning that the princes, the principalities uh, and all those that's in the air today, they don't have power over those who are marked by the blood of the Lamb. They don't have power over those who profess the name of Jesus Christ. Um, I also uh, asked the, the church last week, why do you think um, the agenda of Hollywood, when they make their movies, you will never hear them cursing the name of, of Allah or Muhammad or Buddha, but they will forever and a day just curse out the name of the Lord. That should show you that there's a big animosity against um, the children of God today. Um, you should. We were also asking, how is it that South Africa... Um, claiming to be predominantly a Christian country, but in our schooling system, we don't even allow people anymore to talk about uh, Jesus. But when a person, wherever they are in the country, uh, let's say a, a country that is uh, predominantly Islam, or when an Islamic group of people uh, enter a place and they build a school, which I think they call it a madrash, that, 
The whole school system is built on teachings from their Quran. But we have rejected uh, the, the teachings of the Lord. And with that, just like when, when Israel came to, to Moses and said, no, um, or actually not, yeah, the, Israel came and said, uh, we, we want a king, right? We want a king just as the other nations, a king that we can see. What was the response from God? He said, uh, now that you have rejected me as your king, it's exactly the same thing today. We see that people uh, who used to have uh, Bible studies and, and, and prayer in school, the same group of people in the schooling system are now saying, no, we don't want that. So that is, in effect, rejecting the Lord as our king. But uh, praise the Lord, we proclaim him this morning as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Because he says that when he comes, ne, uh, when Jesus returns, every eye shall see him and every knee shall bow and everyone shall proclaim that he is the king of kings. And you know what? We are all looking forward to that day. So there's a, there's a couple of things that, um, that we want to highlight this morning. The, the important thing is, you will see the theme of our message this morning is, well done, you good and faithful servant. I think for anybody who, who came to, to, to serve the Lord, those are the words that you crave to hear one day, isn't it? Those are... Those are the, the absolute, that's your, your final score, your final report that the Lord will give to you. Um, when we stand that day in judgment, he said on the left, he will separate, he will keep the goats on his left and the sheep on his right. And to the sheep, he will have a certain message. And to the goats, he will have a certain message. And to the sheep, he will have a certain message. So we realize that Jesus has called us, uh, he has redeemed us, he has saved us, but he left. Jesus didn't continue on the earth. He actually left because he finished the works that was required to be done on earth so that every human being will have access after his death to the throne of God. But then he said, I also had to go up to heaven because remember, as Satan has defiled um, everything that God has made holy, Jesus had to had to, as, he, as he went up from, uh, from earth, he also had to go into heavens to go and sanctify everything and made everything ready. That's why he said, I go to prepare a place for you. In the house of my father, there is many mansions. So um, he also gave promises to, uh, to his followers to say that you will rule with me. So Jesus is really talking about um, him having to go up, he became our mediator in heavenly places. He's sitting there pleading for us um, with his blood, obviously, as evidence um, that the price has been paid. Um, so it's important that uh, when you come to salvation, that you understand what Christ has already been doing for you, what he is busy doing and what he's going to do so that you can build your life in such a way that you will be found worthy when he calls your name and is asking to give to give a report. Last week we also touched on, isn't it amazing to think that um, uh, Job thought that his life was just miserable and all these things were happening to him. But at the end of the day, we that has we've got the book now today that tells us that Job's life was just um, an outcome of decisions that were taken in heaven. So, and at the end of the day, God really just protected Job and had a report about him when he asked Satan, um, have you paid attention to my servant, Job? Again, servant. So, so what if God had asked that question about yourself, right? Uh, what would that sound like? What would that look like? So let's quickly look at... Um, um, how do we how do we serve the Lord, right? And as I'm saying, the important thing here is Jesus Jesus would would save us and um, and He would purchase us, so we become 
I want to call it God's property. I like that word. So you cannot touch me because I belong to God, right? Um, now, from there, he's also given us some tasks. He's asking us, he said, I'm, not, I'm no longer calling you brothers, but now I call you friends. We, we, read, we, we listen to the language of Paul when he's speaking. He's talking about being a co-laborer with God. So, um, in Afrikaans praat ons van een medewerker. So, Paulus praat van hy werk met Christus. Hy werk met die Heilige Geest. Die Heilige Geest lei om. So, toe Jesus opgevaar het na die jimmele, gee hy vir hulle opdracht en hy sê vir hulle, um, gaan wacht vir my in Jerusalem en dan gaan jylle kracht, daar gaan jylle kracht ontvang van boe en dan sê hy, hoekom gaan jylle kracht ontvang? Jylle gaan kracht ontvang so dat jylle getuienisse kan wees van my so that you can be witnesses, right? You need to go and testify to the world what is done, what is happened, what is happening now and what is to come, talking about God's eternal plan. So, um, now we realize that He, he has not just saved me to, to come to church and just have a, you know, a look good, feel good message. No, he's actually talking about um, all these parables where he talks of giving talents to people, right? Giving talents to people, but not just leaving them with those talents. To, to, uh, the master will also come and he will ask, he will hold you accountable en gaan jou, uh, jy is aanspreeklik vir dit wat God jou gegeet, en dit is waar vir waar waar ons wil praat, en, um, en wat, wat, wat amazing is, is ek gaan net so vinnig, ek het een paar skrifte wat ek saam met julle wil deel, um, maar, die eerste ding wat ons moet doodseker is van, is dat, everybody is called for servanthood, every single believer, has been called, to become a servant of the Most High. And uh, I want to take you through a couple of uh, examples in, in, in scriptures that will, after this session, show you that what you used to think is the job of your pastor, your prophet, your elder, it's actually your responsibility, right? They have been gifted to assist the, the bigger body of, of Christ. But just as the pastor is a servant of the Most High, so is the believer and the follower also a servant of the Most High. And, um, and obviously he talks about the gifts and the grace that he has given to different people in different measures. But ultimately, what I like about uh, in Matthew 24, uh, sorry, Matthew 25 from verse 14, he talks about the parables of the talents. And if you look at this, um, we said last week's message was, repent for the kingdom of God is here. Now Christ is coming and is explaining to people what the kingdom of God looks like. And uh, I was also asking, why did, he, why did he give comparisons? Why did he give us these little markers, if I can call it that? Um, and, 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 and you will realize it's because the kingdom of God is actually like a hidden treasure. It is iets wat weggesteek is. Dis hoe kom hy sê in Matthäus 6 vers 33, soek allereerst die koninkryk van God en sy gerechtigheid. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all his other things will be added unto you. So, it's something that you, that you must seek. You must make it your life's uh, mission to search for this. So, very quickly, he talks about the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to the other one he gave um, two, and to the other one he gave one talent, according to his own ability. That's important. Uh, and immediately he went on a journey. So here Jesus is really telling you that um, he came from heaven and then he collected his servants and he gave talents to each one according to their own ability. And then he went away, right? Um, and then he had received, uh, then the one who had received five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, who had received two, gained two also. But he who had received one went and dug it in the ground and hid his Lord's money. 
after a long time, the Lord, wow, that's an important one. After a long time, Jesus is coming back. The Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. My, oh my. This, you know, the nice thing about Jesus is as much as he would tell you a parable, he's also telling you exactly what's going to happen. I like the way Pastor Sway said it when we started with the, the, the study of the parables. He said a parable is an earthly message or earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So don't forget it. Um, so he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, and these are the sweetest words you can ever imagine. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you a ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. This is amazing. And the same story happened to the one who had five. And again, the Lord said, I want to repeat this. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And that's where I want to just uh, keep um, uh, that. So you must also remember when uh, in speech, whenever something is repeated either twice or thrice, um, it is to give emphasis. It, is, it is, is something important to note. So the Lord is showing us whether you have five or whether you have two or whether you have one, it's not about how much or how little you've received. But the principle here is that you will have to give account you will have to give account and um, and uh, whatever you have in your life and you will see as the story is evolving where we are going with this whatever you have received in your life you need to demonstrate that you have been productive with it that's the reason why in other parables he talks about a fig tree and he expected the tree to give fruit so you need to be productive all right um and, and, and very quickly, I know people are now making calculations and, and browsing through their memory files. What is the Lord given unto me? What is the Lord given in my care? And what have I done with it for so long that I've been a servant of the Lord? So think about this. Now, at the end of the day, the one servant who only received one and didn't do anything about it, the Lord was really not happy with it. That's not... That's not the message I want I want to talk to 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 today, um, but ultimately he just said I had one and I know you're a hard lord, so I thought I don't want to lose this thing. I dug it into the hole and I left it there, and this is the only one that you've given back to me, uh, and I'm giving it back to you. And we know that the lord of this this lord was very angry with this guy. He said, "Listen to this, the words it is using, you wicked." And lazy servant, you knew that I had that that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bank, and at the coming, at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from me and give it to the one who has ten talents. And uh, for to everyone who has more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow. So, Jesus, if we can just quickly analyze this parable. Obviously, he's the master. Handing out gifts. He's coming back and he's saying, even to the ones who were in his service. And that's the important thing I want to show people today is that. You can even be in the service of the Lord and you are not fulfilling his requirements. You are not living. You are not, again, the story of you, it's, this guy was not found worthy. Why? Because he's been given everything. The Lord tells us in Ephesians 1 verse 3 that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Whatever you can think of. Remember that even uh, Abraham and, and Daniel and these guys didn't have the full measure of the Spirit of God today, right? So 
Here comes um, the, the Lord. He gives the person a talent. And um, the only thing this person is doing is handing him back exactly the same thing. But listen to the, the first instruction of God when he created Adam and Eve. He said, be fruitful and multiply. So God's intention is always that whatever he's entrusted you with, you must be able to, to make more of that. And um, the specific words that he's using, and this is actually a judgment, isn't it? He says, you wicked and lazy servant. Wow. These, these are exactly the words I think no one wants to hear. So what's the use? You keep yourself from sinning. You, you don't do all these, um, what do you call it, uh, sinful things. You come to church and at the end of the day, you also receive words like this. How horrible would that be? Right? So let us not be the ones that um, will be receiving these words. So very, very importantly, uh, um, we talked about everybody being called um, to the service, uh, to servanthood. So what does the Lord do? He say, Jesus looks at people, he, look, he looks at them and um, he's realizing that people are burdened, people are working for this very tough um, system, this world that is just taking and taking and taking from them. And the more they earn, the more the world will just find a way to take all their money from them, whether it's through toll gates, uh, through increasing taxes, through increasing VAT, through license, TV license, you can name it. Um, they will just not give you anything for free. Um, and at the end of the day, they don't even make, I don't really want to go down this, this line now, but, but the rulers of this world um, are not necessarily thinking of ways how to make life easier for people. But here comes Jesus in Matthew 11, verse 28, and he's saying, um, Come to me, all who are heavy laden. Come to me, all of you who are weary, all of you who are tired, who are exhausted, and who are burned out. And he's giving them a reason why he calls them, and he says, You know why I'm calling you? I'm asking you to take my yoke upon you because my burden is light and my yoke is easy. So Christ is saying, don't you want to trade jobs? Don't you want to leave what you are busy with and come work for me? Come work with me, right? Does this not remind us of the calling when he started calling the 12 disciples? He said to them, come follow me, right? Not with a long job description. He just said, you are fishers now, right? Fishers, you, you're fishermen, but I will make you fishers of men, right? So he's telling you that when you come to work for me, I will empower you and I will qualify you for the work that you have to do, right? And this is amazing. So Jesus made that call. And very quickly, I want to run through, um, through a couple of things that Jesus talked specifically about servants, their masters, and the issue around leadership. So, in one point, um, Jesus is talking about you cannot serve two masters. That is the reason why he is contrasting his burden with the burden of the world, with the burden of mammon. He's saying you cannot work for both God and for mammon, right? So now, if you, if you look at that, he said, you will either hate the one and love the other one, um, uh, but, but, but you cannot do, you, you won't be able to give exactly the same amount of energy and time for both of them at the same time. And that is, this is today where the modern child of God really finds um, it difficult because the world successfully has, has created systems where you cannot do anything without their approval uh, and without um, what they call their, their lifeblood, which is money, right? And yes, we, we spoke about money the other day to just let you know that um, money ultimately is just a control. It's just an, an illusion of control um, where, where, where people are, are, being, are being pushed into corners 
where people are being motivated falsely, where people are, are, are expecting to do um, crazy things just to get to, to stuff that God has made for free anyway, right? So no matter what they tell you, their money cannot make another mealy. You, you understand? You cannot, you cannot, that is something that's already created. They cannot create more soil. They cannot create more water. All these things are already there. That is the reason why Jesus said, you got to repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. We are used to the kingdoms of this world. We are used to the kingdom system. But now I come with a message to tell you all that the kingdom has arrived. The kingdom of God is on earth now. It used to be in heaven, but I came from heaven with the kingdom of God. And now that the kingdom of heaven is on earth, let me demonstrate to you what the kingdom of God is looking like. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Just before that, he was talking about what shall you eat, what shall you drink, what shall you wear? And he's saying, no, 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 no. When you are in the kingdom of God, you ought not to worry about these things. Because look at the birds of the sky, the birds that I have made. They do not gather in barns, they do not sow, they do not reap, right? Yet, every single day, they've got something to eat. Look at the lilies that grows in the, in, 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 in the field, right? And not even uh, Solomon, that was the, the richest person that, that lived in his day, was dressed in such glory. Yet the, the sun comes over that flower and it withers away. He's trying to demonstrate to you the difference between the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. And he's calling everyone and he says, repent for the kingdom is right here. It used to be far, but it is now at hand right and all of a sudden jesus starts with a recruitment plan he starts by giving a job descriptions he start by explaining explicitly what the kingdom of god is looking like and all his parables all of these earthly little stories these comparisons he's trying to contrast the kingdom of the world with his kingdom oh my word this is so beautiful if you understand that um, um, Jesus even he, he said to them, uh, there was a certain there was a mother that came and she was asking, um, Lord, Lord, I can understand your kingdom. I understand you are the one in power. We saw how the demons listened to you. Oh, we can understand, Messiah, you are here. Wonderful, great. The salvation of the Lord is here. I've got one request from you. Can one of my sons sit on the right hand and the and the other one? On your left hand in the day that you will reign and there Jesus is just debunking the whole nonsense that's happening today where people are fighting for positions of leadership where people want to be on top at the expense of whoever they are going to trample upon to get there and Jesus said to her madam sorry Tani Nia that work me soon in my kingdom it's not about the person who wants to be on top should be the one who is willing to do the lowliest part of work. He should be a servant. A servant. That is the characteristic that is needed. That is the person who will make it to, to, to be appointed in a position of authority. Because just as I who came from the highest authority, remember Jesus said he's got the highest name, but he came down in the form of a servant. He took the body of a servant and he demonstrated it the very last act the very last physical act that the master did before he went uh, to be crucified he asked his disciples to sit down and he washed the dirtiest part of their body which were the feet the lowliest portion of their body he washed it that is an important demonstration of showing the contrast now i'm asking you Please show me which CEO has ever washed a feet of, of, of their employees. Please show me which president ever washed the feet of a Tani uh, uh, that, that, that is following them. Can you see 
that Jesus brought the difference. He showed us that I am the good shepherd. I am laying down my life for my sheep. I am willing to go all the end. What do they do today? You look at the leadership of this world. They've got the best of the best. They've got bodyguards around them. They, they, they get the most expensive vehicles, the luxury, luxury of this life. They take it all for themselves at the expense of the very same people who trusted them with their lives, who voted for them, who believed. It's important that word. You believed so much that a human being in the form of a government system will deliver you, will take you to a better place. And my oh my, poor fellow South Africans, we can see where this thing has been leading us to. Why? Because they are not following the principles of the kingdom of God. It's as simple as that. And when I talk about governments, I'm not just referring, I'm not on the same negative storyline around our government, but I'm talking of governments in general. I'm talking of people who has accepted the principles of demo democratic governments, of fascist governments, or whatever systems that this world is, is, is conjured up, or whatever systems um, that they have built based on the influence of the spirit that is leading the world. Unfortunately, the, the end of all those ways will lead to death. That is what the word of God is teaching us. That if you are not following the principles of Jesus, who is the life-giving spirit, the one who took the keys of life and death, from the devil who yelled it before and is now having the ability and authority to bring to life whatever is dead. That's why he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will not die but have eternal life. And, and, and this is really how Christ has been telling his story, talking about his kingdom and talking about his kingship. Over this kingdom but then when he calls you as a servant into his kingdom this is not a matter of eating and drinking and touching don't touch this don't put this no he says the kingdom of God is a matter of power the kingdom of God is is, 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 is righteousness it's 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 peace it's holiness the kingdom of God is a very serious matter it is the highest calling that every human being has been called to and it's important to understand that God does not mess around with his anointing. His anointing is so precious to him. His anointing is so powerful. He said to Moses, this is the recipe that you must put together to make this anointing. And I will talk about the anointing of God a little later now. But he said, but for everyone or anyone who is trying to imitate this anointing, which talks about this the specific and special purpose uh, of, of, of what God has made it for, right? Um, um, the, 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 the person who wants to, 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 to copy this will certainly be killed, right? He will be cursed. What is he talking about here? You see, let me give you a quick, quick um, breakdown of leadership. Um, you will find that the Western world, which is really influenced by, by Greek mythology and uh, really the Roman Greco uh, kingdoms, right? They influence the whole world. Um, but it's very important to go and understand that the Bible is not an English book. The Bible is not an Afrikaans book. The Bible is a transla it's translated in languages, but the Bible came from three languages as it was recorded and the language is actually a spiritual language. It's actually a language, it's a heavenly language. That's why he's saying the letter, this, the letter on the paper is dead. It's a dead thing. It's literally, it, it cannot speak for itself. It's dead. But the spirit makes it alive. That is why a spiritual person can judge things spiritually or spiritual matters. But a person who is carnal minded can read these words and he will not understand a single thing. Right. So here it goes. Roman Greco. When they would um, 
appoint a king, what do they do? They put a physical crown on the head of that person. It's very important. But when the Hebrews in God's system, what did God use to mark authority, to appoint authority? He took anointing oil and he would make a circle around the head of that person, anointing them, speaking of the invisible power of God, speaking of who is invisible is appointing you. Your, your authority is coming from above and not from men. But men, if you look at democracy, as Pastor Swayze always mentioned, these are the arrangements of men, of how a person will vote the other one into power, which is just as weak as you are, who is just as vile as you are. But we believe that amongst ourselves, we can think and figure out uh, this person is better than the other. And guess what? Whenever they come there, we all realize that, ah, you know what? When he goes to the toilet, it's the same smell that what I'm doing, right? There's nothing different, guys. It's the same thing. But all of a sudden, the same happens with, with, with Hollywood. The whole nonsense of what they call celebrities or VIPs and the one person is more important than the other. Jesus, again, is contrasting this when he is saying, come to me, everyone, all of you, come and buy from me, even those without money. I want to touch the story again where the guys are coming to you and they and they and they came with a trick question while Jesus is explaining his kingdom message to them they come and they ask him so what do you say about taxes what do you say about uh, should we should we go, go after money and work for money what did he do a, a similar thing that's going to happen to us in this last days going forward he asked them Please give me a coin. Please show me what is this thing that you talk about? What is this money? Not because he didn't know, but he wanted to demonstrate something to the kingdoms of this world. And they gave him a coin. And he's asking, whose image is this? That's a very, that's a profound question. You know that even professors are missing this. Whose image is this? So it talks about men. You made an image. You took an image. You made the image of men. Speaking about the commandment that said, you shall not make an image of anything, of a calf, of a person, of something in it. You, whose image is this? You made it with your own hands. This thing that you call money. You know what? Let me show you what I think about it. And he puts it in his pocket. No, 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 no. Go read your Bible. He takes that coin and he says, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. So he's saying, give to the world. And if you understand what Caesar represented at that stage, being probably the most powerful person in, the, in that world, because Rome at that stage conquered even the mighty Jerusalem. Don't forget that. They conquered even the unconquerable kingdom, which was Israel. Because if God was with Israel, no power could stand against Israel, right? Because people found themselves fighting against God himself, right? So when Caesar conquers and besieged Jerusalem, it means that they grew so powerful that they managed to conquer even the strongest nation. The nation that's supposed to enjoy the promises, the protection of God. Can you understand how high-minded Caesar would have been, how proud and arrogant, just like Nebuchadnezzar, how powerful he became in his mind. And the very thing that kept his military going was the gold and the taxes that he was collecting, exactly as we're doing now. Yesterday we were speaking, I said, guys, please, for those who, are, who want to know what's happening, go and look how expensive a war is. You take a, a missile of 30,000 rand, right? You put it in a, in a launcher. You shoot one of those things, 30,000 rand gone in an instant. For what? To produce life on the other side. No, to kill, steal and destroy. This is what a war is about. You can have any other 
agenda or political message around it, but the end result of a war is always the death of the image or the person who was created in the image of God. Unfortunately, we have to call things for what they are. Because Jesus said, you see, the ruler of this world is a liar and has been lying from the beginning of times, right? And he came to do nothing else but to steal, kill, and destroy. So when you look at what is happening in the kingdoms of the world, you will always find those things happening. Kill, steal, destroy. I'm sorry to say, guys, but this is it. If you are bringing, you are working and you are getting paid, do you know that your money is already taken from you without even you asking for it? Let me show you. It's, it's critically important to show you how you've been lied to all your life. So you get 10,000 rand according to your company. But when you get the money in your bank, you only have 7,000 rand. So where's my 3,000 rand? No, it's taken. But I didn't agree to it. So typically, that is really stealing from me. Okay, I don't want to cause a revolt here, but let us look at principles. So I did never agreed to give you 3,000 rand in taxes, right? You just took it from me. Here's the other story. The Lord comes to us and he's saying, guys, when it comes to giving in my kingdom, I love a cheerful giver. Giving, not taking. So now when you will work, it will be great of you if you can give 10%. What is that? It's a contrast. So you can have your 10,000 rand and you decide, am I going to give or not? Can you, can you see the difference? This is exactly what we, but, but, but the funny thing is now you, you don't even question the people just taking and taking and taking from you, but you have a problem when God is expecting you to give. And you know what is nice about it? Please go do yourself a favor and read how the tenth used to be applied. He said, when you give, the only reason you give, guys, I don't even need your money. I don't need these things. I don't need it, says God. You give so that you can eat from it tomorrow. So that the person who is weaker than you can have something to eat tomorrow. Right? We will talk about that sometime uh, in future. But we need to understand that God has he has worked out, right? He has prophesied time and time and time again about his suffering servant. Please go and research this one as well. Did you know that Isaiah 53, the chapter, Isaiah 53, it's important. Please go and read this, uh, this piece in, in the scripture. So we talked about the leadership, right? And how uh, the leadership of this world is not the same as the leadership of the kingdom of God. Um, and I hope by now for those who are in a church where your pastor is sitting on a big chair and your pastor is driving the biggest car and your pastor is the richest person in the congregation, by now you should have already just left the church and know that you are probably serving a wrong system here. Um, I want to tell you that you know that Jesus was so common. Jesus was so common amongst the people that by the time they had to arrest him, Judas had to show, to show him out with a kiss. That's important. So, so it's like people were standing in a crowd, right? So ordinary people will have ordinary clothes, right? That's why Jesus said, who did you expect to find when you went to look for John in the desert? Did you expect somebody with, you know, a tuxedo and ripen schooner? And no, look at John. And he still says that John was the greatest person that was ever born on this planet. But look at how humbly he dressed. Now you see, today you look at people and you find the pastor is the best dressed is the high, and the other people just look like ordinary people. Which system are you following? No, you can expect those things from the celebrities, not from the kingdom of God. But we must look after each other as brothers and sisters. We are supposed to carry each other's burdens Ons moet ons die laste wat ons het vir ons broers en sister, hulle is die laste moet ons jou dra. 
En dit is wat de dienstknecht van God doen. So, what I want to talk to you uh, about is the issue of of realizing that if your leader does not serve he's probably is if he's not serving you or the congregation he's probably serving himself or something else i don't know so um be careful who is leading you and who you allow to lead you so jesus is telling people that i'm calling you to become a servant right and as you are becoming a servant of Christ he tells you how a servant will conduct himself he tells you uh yes yes one thing that i that i really need to touch as well um people come and they still quote the scripture where where the lord is saying if you even if your if your faith is as small as a mustard seed you will be able to do great things right so why is your faith still as small as a mustard seed why are we not saying your faith is now as big as an apple your faith is now as big as a watermelon your faith why are you still not believing why is it come on i mean this is this is what really frustrates me where i where i see we have been receiving gifts that is even surpassing the highest level of educated people on this planet right because all of a sudden you can speak a language without being taught without being going to to universities is giving you a gift is giving you an assistant called uh, the comforter the helper the advocate the parakletos the indwelling power of god within you it's given to you but still you cannot even open your mouth and say any significant thing here on earth you cannot apply your faith you cannot read the word of god and get insight and wisdom from the word of god practicing your faith so that it can grow bigger so if a if a if a seed this small can move a mountain imagine what is yeah so yes yeah, sorry guys i'm getting excited here um jesus had the same issue he he demonstrated the kingdom of god he, he gave people bread you know from from a few loaves of bread he fed thousands he walked on the water and then the same people who has been trained the same people who has been exposed to the kingdom of god is in a storm and they don't know what to do and they go to the master crying don't you care that we are perishing what was the response of the lord he said oh ye of little faith what did he, what does he mean by that he expected them to have already been doing something about this why are you bothering the master and this is exactly what we have we have so many at our disposal we've got the angels that we, that is ministering flames unto us but none of us can even come on a sunday and testify of how an angel has helped you of how the power of god has worked through you of how you allowed your light to shine into the darkness what are you doing i just hope that none of us hearing this message will stand one day and receive the words oh you wicked and lazy servant but i would want to pray that this message will reach each child of god and imploring them to become those servants who will not stand back who will not mess around with sin who will who will take the anointing of god the precious anointing very seriously that will take the power and the blood the precious blood of jesus that won't trample that under their feet but make it a serious matter so that god can tell you one day you good and faithful servant well done come enter the joy of the lord right um people are already telling me that i'm over time um but i want to share something very quickly with you just before i'm done here so very quickly let's talk about uh in the old testament we saw jacob 
as a servant, Jacob, who was named Israel later on. Faithful, patient, his father-in-law, you know that he, he wanted to, to marry a certain woman. The father uh, made him work for seven years and then um, he didn't even get the woman that he was promised. He went further, he continued as a servant under his, his, his father-in-law. Um, then it was not even his father-in-law, it was just a promise, but he kept on going until he got the woman that he wanted. And even uh, he even gave a report at the end of the day when they left um, how, how badly he was treated by his master, but he kept on being faithful and God blessed him through that. Moses as a servant, um, we know the report of Moses was that he was the meekest person. He was, he was the sachmudigste mens of aarde. But Moses was fully committed. Moses could have also at any point in time just rejected the plan of God. Or, but in, And if he did, I mean, um, three million people's salvation and probably our salvation today was at risk. But Moses is a servant. Uh, by faith, he went through. Oh, we know the great things that Moses did. Um, and every day, as we were saying, Moses, we could see uh, on the one day he fasted 40 days and he was so consumed with the, with, the, with the awesome work of the Lord that when the people did the wrong thing, he broke the tablets, he went back up and he fasted another 40 days to a point where he was so committed to the Lord. He asked him, now I understand what, what I'm busy with, but please show me your glory. Show me who you are. Moses went deeper and deeper as a servant of the Lord. He just became so consumed with the character and the presence of God that the glory of the Lord just rubbed off on him. And later on, his face started shining to such a point where they had to cover his face because people were running away from him. And this is the kind of glory that is available to each person who is willing to become a faithful servant of Jesus Christ. We talk about Joseph as a servant. Joseph who was humble, <clears throat> sorry, he was diligent. Um, even when, when he got um, the worst part, you know, this, this bad sin of entitlement where you feel that um, the world owes you this. I will fight for this. I will go for this. I'm asking you very nicely in the name of Jesus, repent from that uh, it will lead to your death I'm promising you this please you will see that Jesus is saying no 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 guys don't worry about this I will take care of it the battle is not yours the battle is the Lord's so when we fight we fight the good fight the good fight of faith um, he's saying that we must overcome the evil with our good right so you, you, you saw Joseph that even as he was doing good, he kept on getting evil stuff. But look at how he stayed committed as a servant and God at the right time elevated him to a point where he was the second person in charge over the kingdom of Egypt, um, applying wisdom and saving people from certain death when the famine struck them. So Esther, as a servant, she had compassion, thinking not just of herself, a lavish lifestyle in the king's presence. While she was living all this, this wonderful life, she was mindful of her people who were in bondage, the people who were threatened, the people who were almost uh, being killed. And she risked her own life to save those um, that was uh, facing certain death. David, as a servant, being humble, David knowing that God has called him for greater things. David had revealed that he was himself as the following king, as the opvolger. David had revealed that God is always with him. God had helped him to be a man, to be a man, to be a man. God had helped him as a child to be a man, to be a man. But David stayed humble even when Saul persecuted him. David stayed because he submitted under the appointed authority. David understood that a servant can do nothing else but serve in the place that he has been placed with. And God exalted David as well to a point where he even said, um, the kingdom, your, the kingdom will never depart from you. And we know that Jesus came as the eternal king in, through the loins of David. So John the Baptist as a servant, guys, there's so many examples. Uh, John was so humble. Again, he didn't partake uh, in the food of the day, but the Bible said that he ate honey and locusts and he had ordinary clothes that was just made from camel's hair. Um, 
uh, you, you can clearly see the distinction of a servant of God is really denouncing all the pleasures of this world. A servant of God know that everything that the world gives you is just sugar-coated nonsense because on the outside it looks nice, it tastes nice, but when you break it open, you will realize that there's nothing, there's no substance, there's nothing that takes you forward. Whether they give you a hundred degrees, I'm telling you, you might still not be found worthy when God is pulling your, record, your, your, your report, when God is giving um, a report about you. So please be attentive to the servants that God was pleased with. We look at uh, Mary and Joseph as servants, they were committed to the last day when, when every time they got an instruction from the Lord, they followed it. Even uh, look at them, Bible is, is showing us that they were not the richest people, but God called them in their circumstances to, to usher in a new kingdom, to bring in God on earth. And they were faithful as servants. At the end of the day, we look at Jesus the ultimate suffering servant. When we look at Josiah uh, 53, did you know that this portion of the Bible is taken out? Uh, the, the ordinary Jews today, they don't have this portion of scripture. The very same portion that is supposed to show them that the Messiah was already coming, that, that the Messiah that, that the Lord has promised, that God has been prophesying that, guys, I'm coming at an appointed time. You will find me in this way. Behold, your king is coming humbly, even on the back of a donkey, not on the biggest luxurious vehicle that was available, but on the back of a donkey. And if you please go and read how, how they were talking about what would happen to Jesus? The prophet saw that and, and it was recorded for us uh, in the 53rd chapter. Then you look at uh, Paul. Oh, a beautiful, zealous, bond servant, diligent, sold out. I don't think there's any other a better example for us, uh, for everyone after Christ, as there was with Paul. A person who was so focused who was so consumed with the calling. He even, he even gave us the, the scenario that he, he called himself a bond servant, which is different from an ordinary servant. So when we still had um, the master and the slave in the, in the era of the slave, you would have a person that is uh, into slavery, is, 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 is serving the master. And then at a certain point, um, because of the, 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 the Jewish law, um, they had to let go of their slaves. And um, the master would tell the slave, you are free to go. And uh, the free, the, the, the servant will then decide that, no, I want to stay with you. I will keep on serving you. And they become a bond servant, right? Uh, meaning that they can still at any time decide whether I want to do this or not, whether I want to serve you or not. But Paul is saying that he has actually chained himself up. He has taken the burden of the gospel. He is counting himself as the worst sinner amongst everyone. But he's saying amongst all the apostles, he worked harder than anyone else to be found worthy, to be found worthy of the gospel, to be found worthy of the title as a servant of the Most High. So you can clearly see that even God himself is so attached to the, to the concept of servanthood that he came as, as God, the, the eternal almighty God. He came and he adopted the form of a servant. And throughout his whole life on earth, he was just serving and serving. So my question today to you is, whose servant are you? Whose Wie se diens knecht is jy? In wie se diens staan jy? En is jy seker dat aan die einde van jou dienstwerk gaan jy genoeg samen beloning kry dat jy een eeuwige lewe saam met dit sal hee? Is jy seker dat die type werk wat jy nou doen sal jou lei na die eeuwige lewe? Die goals wat jy vir jouself gestel het, dit waarvoor jy so vroeg opstaan in die ochend en so laat gaan slaap in die aand, is jy seker dat daar die werke sal lei tot die eeuwige lewe vir jou? Are you sure? Are you sure? Whose commands and desires are you fulfilling? 
Whose instructions are you following to the T, to the letter? You won't go left or right from them. These are the questions that every child of God must ask themselves. Hierdie is die vraag wat ons moet vraag, want Jesus praat van een sekere story in, in Johannes, sorry, in Matthäus uh, uh, 24 vers 45, nee? Matthew 24 verse 45, and I'm, I'm finishing with this. He, he gives another example of an evil servant or a wicked servant and a faithful servant. And he says, Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find him so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him and at an hour that he's not aware of and will cut him into in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is where we find ourselves today, children of God. That God is calling us for servanthood. God on, on the cell on, on Thursday, so beautifully, the Holy Spirit he helped us to, to, to check how aligned we are with the mission of God. What is the last mission? The last words when Jesus went up to heaven, he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Meaning that he fulfilled the full requirements of the law to be appointed the chief of staff, the head of us, the king of kings is, is over all. Everything was made for him, by him, through him and for him. Now he's saying, because of this, go into the whole world and teach people about me. Baptize them in my name. Right? And I will be with you until the ends of the earth. Until the ends of time. Nou kan ons duidelik sien dat die Heere gee vir ons vergelijkings van hoe dit is in sy koninkryk. Hy gee vir ons duidelike voorbeelde van dit is hoe die koninkryk van die wereld lyk, dit is hoe die koninkryk van, van, uh, van die jimmel lyk. En dan kom hy en hy sê vir ons, maar ek gee vir julle die koninkryk van God. Johannes 6 vers 38 tot 40, John 6 verse 38 to 40, we, we preached on it the other day, when Jesus was saying, um, this is the will of God, that whoever he has given to me, I shall not lose them, right? I shall take care of whatever God has given to me, and I will save them on the last day. I will raise them up. I will raise them up on the last day. Are we still good? And... The question I want to leave everybody here with today is what has God given under your care? What is it that God has trusted you with? Because Jesus is saying that is the will of God that what, whatever has been given unto him he will not let them fall away. He will take care of it. We see it in the life of Moses as well. When Moses was unsure how he's going to lead um, the children of Israel out of Egypt, the Lord asked him one thing, what do you have in your hand? What is it that God for you created? And met daar die staf, weet ons, het Moses al die wonderwerke verrig. So, practically so, what is it that God for you created? Heideglik staan ek in a werk, heideglik het ek a vrou, ek het kinders, I've got a wife, I've got children, so what are you doing with them? I don't want to go back to say be fruitful and multiply and make more children. Um, yeah, that might not be the, the best advice today, but ultimately it is God's plan, right? Um, but you earn money. What do you do with it? Do you turn the physical money into something that will give you an internal inheritance? Or are you only spending it to fulfill your own needs? Are you, are you using it to execute the king's command? Are you having 
people that you are praying for, people that you are ministering for, are you sharing the gospel? Who is under your care and what is under your care? Are you the one of those who received five talents or three talents or one talent? And what are you doing with it? That brings me to the end of our discussion. And what I can tell you is everybody who serves today, you show up for duty, isn't it? Wherever you work, you work for wages. So nobody works for free. You work and you get paid. You respect the person in authority, isn't it? Appointed over you. You execute their instructions, isn't it? You get disciplined. You will get disciplined if you don't follow their rules. They also provide you with training and development. And ultimately, you will fulfill the master's wish and command. If it is like that for this worldly system that we can see is not so very generous towards us and so very kind to us, how is it that we cannot even do this minimum for the master of masters, for the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And I want to encourage each child of God today that we will be able to really take up the instructions of the Lord, the wish of the Lord, the commands of the Lord and become faithful and worthy, worthy servants. I'm looking forward to the day that when we stand in the queues, and I hear the Lord is calling. Who say La Francois Mare? When your name, when your when your name is being called out, and the Lord can say, "Well done, you good and faithful servant. Come and enter into the house of the Lord." It would be it will be a joyful. It will be a wonderful occasion, and hopefully none of us that said, "Lord, I'm willing." will be receiving the words of you wicked and lazy servant. So I'm sure the message is clear. I'm sure that we are all encouraged um, and we will work very hard for the Lord. There's a whole lot of scriptures that we can still uh, look at and examples of how the Lord is calling us and what he's expecting from us. But let us pray together as we are closing this word. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this word. We pray, mighty God, that you will just burn everything that is that is not maybe accurately said in your presence, but that you will please, my Lord, bring out those gold nuggets, those pieces from heaven, the bread of heaven, that you promise that men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Please let this seed fall into the hearts of men, women who are listening. And may this bring forth a bountiful, abundant fruit of harvest to you, my Lord, in Jesus' name. We pray for every child of God, even those who are facing real persecution at the moment, Lord. Please give them strength. We pray for everyone that is in your household, my Lord. Everyone in the family of God. For every Every leader that is standing on a pulpit, we pray for them, my Lord. We pray for every servant of God, that we will read the word of God and understand that you are calling us to the highest order of service. We thank you for this honor, Lord. Help us not to be sloppy with it. Help us not to be tardy and lazy by executing your word with excellence, my Lord, in Jesus' name. We thank you for this honor and we praise you. And may the name of Jesus be blessed and praised forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. And may you have a blessed Sunday. Amen.